Hey gorgeous, if you want success on your fertility journey, you've got to have the mindset for it. It's time to kick fear, negativity, doubt, shame, jealousy, and the whole clown car of low vibe fertility journey BS to the curb. I'm your host, Roseanne Austin, fertility mindset master, former prosecutor and recovering type A control freak perfectionist. I use the power of mindset to get pregnant naturally and have my baby boy at 43, despite years of fertility treatment failure. I help women across the globe beat the odds on their fertility journey just like I did. Get ready for a quick hit of confidence, joy, feminine badassery, and loads of hell yes for your fertility journey. It's time to get fearless, baby, fearlessly fertile. Let's do this. nice to see you oh my goodness I'm so good (laughs) good how are you I'm good too really good can you believe we're having this moment oh my goodness I have dreamed of this moment for a very long time (laughs) oh my goodness me too well we're gonna jump right in love we're just gonna have our conversation because I mean It's so crazy to me because like when you really think about what we're doing right now, this was, has been on your mind for a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a really long time. I know I was looking back at the vision board that I made when, uh, of course I still look at it every day, but that I made at the beginning of the program, which was almost a like nine months ago. And I had right on there, I I will be on Roseanne's podcast. I love that. I love that. And and look, I mean, we're going to totally get into how you made this manifest because you're probably one of the most powerful, like fifth dimensional manifestors like I've ever met. I mean, like oh, you just thanks. ooze that, that power and we're, we'll get into that. But why don't you start off by telling the ladies listening a little bit about how you found yourself on this journey. Well, it started a long time ago. My husband and I started trying to get pregnant 15 years ago. So it has been a very long, long journey. And so for the first five years, we were still really young and we just were trying naturally and, you know, doing the acupuncture and the diets and all the fertility help that we could. We finally went to a fertility clinic about five years in, so 10 years ago, and we had unexplained infertility, even though his sperm count was a little bit low, but still considered normal. So at that point, we ended up doing IVF, and we did two rounds of IVF 10 years ago, and even though we ended up with about five embryos from that collective experience, I never got pregnant. We did use ICSI just to circumvent any sperm stuff. And I mean, it seemed like a no brainer, but I just never got pregnant. So that put me into a huge spin because at that point, like five years in, IVF to us felt like a last resort. Like obviously with us being young and if we're going to do that, like that's going to work. And so when even that didn't work, we were completely shattered, completely devastated. And I did not know where else to go. And at that point, the fertility doctors were like, well, if this is the result that we've had, like, I don't know that anything will ever be any different. So that really put us into a lot of soul searching and, you know, asking more questions and just trying to figure out, try to get to the bottom of what was going on. And so probably finally four years ago, we started working with a new fertility clinic And he suspected that the reason I wasn't getting pregnant was immune related. And nobody had ever mentioned that before. He's like, well, you've had healthy embryos, but you've never even had a positive pregnancy test. So at this point, we're 11 years into our journey. And so his idea at that point was, let's do one more round of IVF with your own eggs. We'll do ICSI. We'll do the immunosuppressants. And if that doesn't work, well, then we'll have to move on to donor eggs. We had ruled out genetic components. We had ruled out everything else. So that's what we did. And I had done a lot of healing at that point too, just on my own physical body and mental, emotional health. And I finally got pregnant for the first time with immunosuppressants and a round of IVF. So we were over the moon. I mean, 11 years in, I can't even explain to you 
what that felt like when we, at that point, were like, this may never happen for us. It had been such a long time. So at the seven week ultrasound, though, it was non viable. I had a blighted ovum pregnancy. So that was something that came completely out of left field. I was not expecting that. Like, I thought once I finally got pregnant, I would just stay pregnant. So we had to go through a chemical miscarriage. But luckily, we had two embryos left at that point. So we did the immunosuppressants again. We transferred our best remaining embryo. And that's when I got pregnant with my son, Blake. So he is almost four years old now. And that was just, I mean, at that point, I thought I had arrived, right? Like we had figured it out. We had cracked the code. We knew what the problem had been all of that time. And we had this baby. Now, my husband and I are 10 years apart. He's 10 years older than I am. So at this point, like he was getting tired with this journey too. And I really wanted more children. Like I, you know, I was so incredibly blessed to have the one. And there was a part of me and and everyone would be like, well, you have one child that you really should just be happy with that. Right. You know, and, and there was a part of me that understood that, but yet my family just did not feel complete. And I really wanted another baby. So Chris was like, well, we have one embryo left. So when Blake was 18 months old, we transferred that remaining embryo with the same clinic with the immunosuppressants, the whole protocol. And I got pregnant again, no problem. Seven week ultrasound, another blighted ovum. And that was so devastating. I can still remember because at that point I was like, it's over now. Like my husband, with the age that he was at, he was like, I will not go through IVF again. And I was like, but we finally figured it out. We finally cracked the code. This is the only way that I know to get pregnant and, and, and continue our family. And you're saying, no, like you're done. And I get that. I mean, at, at this point we were, oh my gosh, 13 years in to the journey. I understand, but I just knew there was another baby there and I couldn't imagine our family with just the three of us. So at that point, I was desperate to get pregnant again. And so I convinced him to do one more round of IVF. I was like, we, we know what we're doing. And our doctor even said, he goes, well, Robin, we have the formula now. Like, it's no problem. We'll just do another round of IVF. So that's what we did. So Blake was almost two. We did another round of IVF. We did the immunosuppressants. We only had one embryo that looked really great on day three. And my doctor liked to do day three transfers. We did the transfer. On day five, six, they called me to tell me that none of the rest of the embryos had made it. And I just spiraled. Like from that point on, I was, I could not pull my mind out of all the worst case scenarios, all the years of failure, like all of the times it hadn't worked. And I just completely spiraled. And I remember feeling like at that moment it was already over and I hadn't even had my pregnancy test yet. And I just crawled into bed and could not get out. Like I was at the bottom of a hole and sure enough, that pregnancy did not work out. I didn't get pregnant. And then at the end of that, I was like, it's, it's really over. Like, you know, there's no way he'll do another round of IVF. It didn't even work this time anyways. Like what was going on? And that was probably the darkest point of my whole journey, I would say, like the entire journey where I felt like we were completely out of options and answers. But yet I knew our family wasn't complete. So it was that September, a couple of months after that IVF failed, that I heard you on a podcast, another podcast that I was listening to. And when I heard you speaking, I was like, this woman is inside of my head and saying how I have felt on this journey. Like she really understands, she really gets it. And so I started listening to your podcast. I read your book and I I started doing that work. So I was like, yes, it's the mindset piece. Cause I remember, you know, after that transfer, there was a point where I was like, I can't do this again. I can't do this, this pain, this torture, this weight. Like that was, I think our 10th embryo transfer at this time in our journey. I was like, I can't do this anymore. And I was right. I couldn't do that that way anymore because that was not working. That was shit. That was hell. And so listening to 
your podcast every week and, and reading your book. I was like, this woman has something for me. So we did a lot of healing over those next months. And fi- like Chris and I did a lot of soul searching and talking. And he finally agreed. He's like, well, you know what? I won't do IVF again, but I could do an IUI with immunosuppressants. And I was like, yeah, let's try that. So I'm like, now I have hope again. There's an answer. Like maybe this will work. So we go to do the IUI with immunosuppressants. Two days before our procedure, everything shuts down because of COVID. Everything. And I hit another low, like a huge low. And that was when I said to Chris at that point, I was like, my mindset is so shit. I was like, I need to work with this woman. I need to work with Roseanne. Like it's time for me to, I need some help. I need some coaching. All the things that I did before, all the things that got us to our pregnancy with Blake, they're not enough. Like I, you know, all the pieces to the puzzle, like there's something still missing here and I need help. I need, I need coaching. And that's how I met you. And then the universe brought us together. Wow. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I listen, because I mean, because I know your story, like I just get blown away listening to it again, because it is such a testament to who you are and, and frankly, who you have become in order for us to be working with numbers like 11 years. 13 years, you know, all of these, you know, and and I also love, I mean, because they're, I think the bottom line, when we, when we're first looking at your story is a story of a woman who clearly understood in her heart that there was more to her family than, than Mm -hmm. was immediately that could be seen. Because I think you raise a really good point is for those women out there listening that have a child and are struggling to have another one, that desire is just as valid as anyone who has yet to have a child. Like there's this weird kind of, maybe competitive is not the word. It's more or less like society tells us we should just be happy with what we have which is such a, a silencing of the soul. It, it, is, it is a catastrophe and, and travesty for people who fall into the trap of thinking that you should just, you know, th- there's a difference between being ungrateful and grateful and desiring more. And what mm-hmm. you're talking about is being grateful and knowing in your soul there's more. And that is gangster like that is real that is when you know you're in your purpose where you can say yes and I want I have these amazing blessings and I want more like I mean think about who you had to be to stand by that yeah and to be allowed to feel that because it wasn't just society it was my husband who was saying to me you should be grateful look what we have look at our perfect son And I would say to him, I was like, honey, I love our son so much that I just want more. Like I want another baby. I want another child. I want a sibling for him. Like, and I felt wrong for that, you know? So uh, that was a big part of our work together. And then hearing the other women on the calls who were, some of them were trying for a second baby, that it was okay to want that. And that just because you were so blessed didn't mean you got no more blessings. I remember you always saying like the universe has deep pockets. This is okay. And it's just, it's just more love. I was like, I want more love in our life. I want more. And allowing that to be okay was huge. Like learning how to receive that was huge because there was a big part of me that just felt like I should just be shut up and be fucking grateful for what I already had, you know? And especially when it was so much work and so hard to get there, it wasn't like I just got pregnant by accident one day and I could like sneak it in there and and nobody would have to question that. And, you know, then I could just be like, oh gosh, no, we're just so blessed. It was, that was not our story. We needed the IVF. We needed the work. We needed, I said to Chris, I was like, our children are so intentional. Like we have to 
commit to wanting them every single day to get them here. Like it was a huge commitment to getting our kids here, you know, and that was that like the why had to be so big that we were, that for me, I was willing to do whatever it took to get us there. Yeah. And I think, you know, and it's interesting because your story also encompasses this idea that there is a recipe, right? right. Like, and I love, I love the way that you said, you know, we crack the code, but I think yeah. what you're, you're demonstrating is that to get Blake here was one series of behaviors and one way of being, but to get baby number two here was going to ask you to level up. Yes. Like, cause I've seen Blake, you make beautiful babies. <laughs> you make these adorable babies. Thank so, you. so what is it? So let's talk about like that idea of having, you know, being invited to this next level, like talk about that because you were someone who, you know, this, this kind of work was not completely foreign to you, but you had to be willing to be pushed and you had to be willing to be open. So let's talk about that. Like, yes, different this time. Well, first of all, I was completely blindsided by the fact that I had to level up to have this second baby because I thought I had arrived. I had done so much work to get to Blake. I was like, oh, we are here now. Like, oh my gosh, my journey, of course. My journey was so long because look at the person I had to become to become Blake's mother. I thought I was done. <laughs> oh, so, we're never done, sis. No. Right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, it's so funny in retrospect, because of course I wasn't done. Like, this is a completely different person. This is a different soul. And of course I had to continue to grow and stretch to become this person's mother. So <clears throat> the thing that I had to do and that, that I, the biggest thing that I learned from you was how to reprogram my automatic mental responses to things. So because of 15 years of trauma, 15 years of, of a certain results and like period after period, like never having a positive pregnancy test in 15 years, except for those few IVF transfers. I was so programmed for failure. And when I was working with you, it was the repetition and the repetition of the positive affirmations of, of, you know, being able to trust in my body, trust in this baby, trust in Gus. I had to have that repeated week after week and like working through all of the modules in that first program. I was tired. Like I had to dig deep. I was mentally, emotionally and physically exhausted just because it was such hard work to reprogram what was so automatic for me. And I didn't even know I'm a pretty positive person. But when it came to this journey, I had so little faith in my body's own abilities. And, and even just that, like, you know, knowing that this next child was coming, I had such faith in that. And, and I mean, even through my own meditations, she had showed me she was a girl. She had given me her name. So I'd been connecting with her on that level. But there was still that subconscious part of me that was like, is this ever going to happen? So through the repetition of our work together, that is what made the biggest change for me. And it got to the point where I started thinking in your voice, you know, where I would have these, <laughs> these I'd be like, well, Roseanne would say X, Y, Z, or I would have these responses that became automatic. And it was so exciting. And it was such a huge change. And my husband noticed a huge change because finally, I remember we finally did get like, they opened up our, um, clinics again. And we did finally get to do the IUI with immunosuppressants. That was at the end of our eight week program that I did with you, but I had opted, I knew I needed more reprogramming. So that's when I continued to do the one-on-one -on -one stuff with you for the next six, six months after that. But we did the IUI with immunosuppressants. I was feeling like a million bucks. I totally believed my baby was coming. Totally thought it was going to work. And it didn't. And I didn't get pregnant. And it was in that moment where I was like, you know what? 
we do need the, the IVF for me and my husband, like for us, our story, we do need the IVF. We do need to have the sperm help too. We need the immunosuppressants for my immune system, but we also have his factor. And I remember some of the conversations with you and being like, it's not just one, it's both of us, right? Like we have to move around this. And so then how do I talk to him about this? That was the other thing. Like, how do I, how do I share with my husband where, where if I even begin to mention IVF, he completely shuts down because he was tired. He didn't want to do it anymore. And so through our work, I was able to just get into touch with the fact that this is my purpose. Like this is part of my life's calling. And I was able to then bring that to him in a way where he could understand that and, and, and see my heart. And I didn't have those skills or tools before our work together. It was always very confrontational and, and, um, blamey and kind of gross, right? When we try to talk about this stuff and desperate, I was always very desperate. And so through those changes of really being able to just connect in with my purpose and how this is meant for me, I was like, this isn't going to go away. You know, like this desire in my heart is not going to go away. This is part of who I am. And just through that softening and that sharing and, and even after we would have all of our calls, Chris and I would talk about things that we had learned and it was just so, such a bolstering for him too. And he was finally able to say like, okay, we can do one more round. And I mean, I felt so fortunate and so, I mean, I, I was so blessed that he was willing to go down that road one more time with me. Yeah. So, and, and and I have to comment on something because I, you know, I know Chris a little bit to, you know, just kind of yeah. from the, you know, on the periphery. I mean, because you have one of the most amazing husbands in the world that just I do truly adores you. True, like you know, it's like he he was fighting this, but he he loves you so much that he was trying to find a way to wrap his head around it and like <laughs> just you know. The, the transformation in you unquestionably set the stage for a transformation in him. This is kind of that, yes. that, that thing that I talk about, you know, with, with all of you ladies, I say like, we are the keepers of our relationships. We set the tone and we set the tenor in our relationships and we can lead without emasculation of our partner you know, that there, you allowed yourself to become, and he followed. Yes. In a really empowered way that both of you could win. What do you it think? It was a response. Just fair? Yeah. He was able to then respond to my heart and my desire, as opposed to always being defensive, as I'm sure, you know, because, because everything I was, you know, when you talk about trying to get pregnant like a man, that was just so my way, right? Where where everything is so clinical and calculated and, you know, these are the steps that we need to take to get our kids here. So that's what really changed was that being able to really own my desire, own the calling, settle into that, sink into that, and then have him respond to, to that energy. Right. You also, like, I want to make sure we highlight something that was really important that you did because it took a lot of courage and a lot of trust in yourself to say, I can't do this again. That was a really powerful point that, that you were making earlier was this idea that I can't do this again. Yes. I will be on the road to this, you know, my second baby, but I cannot do it this way. Mm -hmm. Like that is massive. Because I think a lot of people fall asleep in their lives and a lot of people get, get, you know, be, become very comfortable in discomfort in that, in a, in a sense where they're, they just get really used to things being shitty and don't even entertain the idea that things can be done differently. What do you think right. about that? Yeah, so true. Because, and I had the comparison because my round of IVF with Blake, where I did get pregnant, it was pretty great. And I was in a really great place. And I was in this really connected place with him as a being. 
And Chris and I were in a really good place. So I had that one round, you know, to, to recall. And so when I did that really crazy, hectic round, I knew things were not right. I could feel that they weren't right. I could feel that I was not right. My head was not healthy. I was not well in my mind. And I knew it. You know, I could feel it. And so I needed training. And I knew that. I was like, I need coaching. I need training. I need to train for this shit. And that's what I did, right? And so then I knew that we were going to do this next round of IVF. We waited the four months. I wanted to do all the egg quality you know, work that I could. I wanted to make sure that I was in a really great place. We chose the month of November because that was Chris's less busy season. So I knew he wouldn't be too stressed. You know, we chose a time where we knew we had the support of our friends to take care of Blake. Cause that's also going through IVF now with a toddler. That is no joke. Yeah. That is not yeah. Yeah. <laughs> as easy. I mean, no IVF is never easy, but it, it has its own special challenges. So then I was training mentally, physically, and emotionally for this next round of IVF, and I wasn't rushing into it this time, right? Like there, that desperation wasn't there anymore. It was like, she's coming, you know? I, and so if she doesn't come before the IVF, we've got the IVF then. And we're going to just give it our all, and we're going to come into it in a very balanced way. Now, was it still stressful? Yeah. Because the other thing was, we finally get to the IVF, looks like we're going to have all these great numbers, and only three of my eggs fertilized this time. And we're like, what the fuck? And I remember calling you or texting you or whatever it was. I was like, oh my God, we only have three fertilized eggs? Like, what? And so I wanted to spin and I wanted, and you just said to me, you're like, Robin, what if exactly what you need is in those three? She's like, what do you want? Like 17 babies? No. Like what if, you know, and you're, I, and I was able to like cry for 10 minutes and then give my head a shake and be like, yes, I trust my body. I trust my baby. I trust Gus. And so anytime that I would start to go down the, oh my God, there's only three and there's only three on day one. And then by day three, like, oh my gosh, you know, I'd be like, no, everything I need is here. I trust my body. I trust my baby. I trust Gus. So I'd interrupt that pattern. And that was something that you taught me because I would just go to crazy town previous to this. <laughs> so being able to interrupt that pattern was massive. So then this new clinic, they didn't do day three transfers. They only did day five. That was new. So, oh, cause, cause my beloved doctor had retired. So we were with a new, a new old clinic. They were still going to do all the immunosuppressants for me. I was able to get everything I needed and wanted. And so on day five, we had one embryo, just one. The other two didn't make it. One embryo. And it was like, well, we only need one embryo. We only need one baby. And I remember thinking like, oh God, what if this doesn't take? And, and then afterwards, well, just, no, we're here now. I trust my body. I trust my baby. And I trust Gus. And so when we did the transfer for this one single embryo, it was at exactly 11, 11 in the morning. Exactly. Like she pressed the plunger at 11, 11. And I remember going like, that has to be a good sign. You know, this has to be. And so the other thing that had happened too, was my doctor really wanted us to freeze the embryo, recover for a month or two, and then transfer. She's like, I would just be remiss if I didn't show you because of your advanced maternal age. If you transfer fresh, you probably won't get pregnant. That's basically what she told me, right? <laughs> She's like, so you're probably going to want to freeze and transfer later. But in my meditations, my daughter had really, I, I was like, I'm pretty sure she wants to be a Leo. Like, I'm pretty sure that's when she's going to be born. And so if we had done a fresh transfer in November, then she would, that's when she would, she would be a Leo. But I was like, I mean, you try to explain that to a doctor and she's like, well, Robin, I know that you, <laughs> as she's rolling her eyes, she goes, I know that you always go with your intuition. So I will support you, but I would be remiss if I did not share with you the statistics. And I was like, so Chris thought I was a nutbag. He was like, are you crazy? Like we, we need to, obviously we need to freeze and transfer later. And so here I am like saying to him, I was like, oh, I know, but there's just the part of me that like, this is what she's shown me. So I think we need to do a fresh transfer. 
And so he was pretty mad at me. I have to say he was pretty mad. He's like, you never take my advice. That's always what you, and I had to like really check where that information was coming from and be like, am I just trying to rush things because I want it to happen sooner? Or is this truly what I think she's telling me? And I, uh, at the end of the day, you know, I was like, I really do think this is what she's telling me. So I was like, we're going to do a fresh transfer against everybody's advice you know, against my husband's advice, but (laughs) I was like, but her, you know, my daughter's advice was to do it now. So that's what we did. And a week before my pregnancy test, I started bleeding and I was convinced, convinced that my period had started. Like I was bleeding and cramping. And I remember talking to you that day too and being like, oh my gosh, like what? And then I really beat myself up for about 12 hours where I was like, why didn't I wait? They all told me to wait. Why did I throw this away? Like, why did I go with my intuition? And my intuition was wrong. Like I've my period and it's all over. And I remember having a call with you that day and you were like, even if you have your period now, does that change the fact that your daughter is coming? And I was like, well, no. You're like, well, then she's going to come another way. And I was like, I do believe that to be true. And then that night, the bleeding stopped. And I took a pregnancy test and it was positive. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's so funny how we can talk about this calmly because having been on the other end of those text messages and everything that we were going back and forth. Like, I remember, you know, like being with you in that moment, but I was like, fuck, something, I just don't buy that it's over. Like, I could not, I mean, like, I, like, I cannot, like, I cannot explain why that was. There was a calmness in me being present with you. I'm like, nah, No, I said, what do we know about your daughter? And this is, isn't this crazy that we can talk about your daughter? Like, you know, in the sense that you open your heart to her and were, you knew her so fully. Mm -hmm. And, and I remember saying something to you, like, I'm like, I don't know. I think this girl is not so predictable. I don't believe that she is you know, she's going to be a wily one. Mm -hmm. And she was. Well, and one of the things, one of the things that I had to work on when on our time together was I had to work on becoming a woman who was open to being surprised. Yes. (laughs) Because, right. Because I was so used to knowing everything and planning everything. And with IVF, there's no, there's no surprises. You know, when your transfer is, you know, exactly your due date. And I remember lamenting, you know, at times being like, oh, I'm never going to just get to be surprised by peeing on a stick and it being positive. Like that will never happen for me. And I cannot tell you how surprised I was that night when I peed on a stick and it was positive. Like oh. that was a huge surprise. I was <laughs> you know, so delightfully surprised. I know. And there was just, I remember when I said that to you, I, I, I think that was one of the things I said, be, be the woman that's willing to be surprised. Yes. Like there was something that came through me that just knew like that kind of a thing was yeah. that there's something that about Robin that needs to be surprised here. Oh yeah. Like, and seeing surprises is not a bad thing. Like you now have evidence in front of you that being a woman who was open to be surprised isn't just negative surprises this is the good shit too right and I've always associated surprises with something negative because and that's the control freak part of me that needs to know it all like don't and so what a beautiful thing and I have a feeling that this girl is gonna love surprises and be all about it like I had to become a woman open to being surprised to be this girl's mama. I know. Well, okay. And so you have to tell us, like, how far along are you now? I am almost 17 weeks pregnant now. Wow. And we do have confirmation that she is indeed a girl, uh, which was another surprise because I, of course, all this time have been connecting in with a girl. Her name's Ruby. And a week before we got our harmony testing done, I had a dream that was a boy. 
And then my girlfriend, who was a spirit baby communicator, who helped me a lot through this process as well, she had a dream that it was a boy. And we were both like, what? Because all along it's been girl, 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 girl. So for the week leading up to us, we had a, a gender reveal cupcake party. And for the week leading up to it, I had like resigned myself to the fact that, oh my gosh, Ruby's a boy. Like, I'm going to have to really get my head around this. And like, we need a new name and what are we going to do? And so for that whole week, it reminded me of that day where I was like, I have my period. Obviously it's over. I would like resign myself now to the fact that I'm having a boy, which is fabulous as well, but different than what I had been expecting. So I, the day that we had our actual party, I was like, yeah, it's a boy. It's obviously a boy. So when I bit into the cupcake and it was pink, I was so surprised. Like somehow she managed to surprise me again. I was completely blown away. I was like, oh my God, it's Ruby. She's a girl. Like, so that was also really, really fun because I was completely surprised. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and she just may be telling you that she's an alpha female. She's coming in with strong (laughs) masculine energy that she is going to be a pistol and Mm -hmm. she's got fire, you know, in her heart. You just never know. And, and I think that's such a, I mean, you have, it's just as an observer, it's interesting for me to be able to look at like Robin when she first came and Robin now, like the, it's like when you're already dealing with someone who is very in tune, like it's like as a coach and as an observer, I'm like, okay, well, where is she going to go next? You know, what, Mm -hmm. what's next for her? And you only go higher from there. Like there's no limit to, to what you can create and the amazingness that you can unleash in your life, you know, when you do the work. So what, if you could like share, like what is one piece of information that you would want women listening to know, like whether they're, they're desiring another baby, you know, to add to their family, or if this is the first baby that they're having, like, what's the piece of information you would want them to know? Never give up. Never give up. That desire, if it's in your heart, like you always say, it's meant for you. But there will be a way. There will be a way through. And if you are lost and you don't know what the next step is, ask for that guidance because there is always somebody out there who has a piece of information or a story or something that they can share. There's always a next step. And the biggest piece is really getting into your bones, that knowledge that yes, my baby is coming. And if you're really struggling with that, you don't know how to get to that place. That's what Roseanne is for. That's what this kind of coaching is for, is to get you mentally to that place. Because I remember even when we would talk about it, you would always call Ruby by her name. You would always say, you know, you're calling in a daughter. There were so many just ways that you affirmed that for me that helped me be like, yes, yes. Like this is happening. This is happening. Just help to interrupt that pattern and give your head a shake, you know, to be like, no, this is happening. And that is the biggest thing. Do not give up. There's always a way. There's always, there's always an answer. And sometimes those answers are within you and you need to learn how to get in there to see what they are. But there's help for that. There's people that can teach you to do that if you don't yeah. know how in this moment. Yeah. And I think that another thing that you, your story really serves to teach is the power of getting on the same page with your partner. Yes. And and to to do that in a really empowered way, because, you know, you're living proof of, of what's possible when you do that and, and to not hide the desire to really embrace the desire. Cause that's exactly what you had to do with Chris. That was a big one for us. And like many times in the 15 years, you know, and again, with our 10 year age difference, we're often on very different pages in our life and in our journey. So being able to find our way back to each other and that was, was so important and it wasn't easy, you know? So, so having that guidance too was just so important, but just knowing like, yeah, like learning how to 
connect with that other person again because that can be hard after like we've been together for almost 18 years at this point right well yeah. and you know and you know the other part of that you know relating to your bump squad is you really learned how to hold your own amongst a you know and I say this with love you had like a cacophony of tackling hyenas like telling you <laughs> like you know lovingly you know super committed to to your dream but telling you this is you know it's crazy to do a fresh transfer why would you do a fresh transfer like but you had to figure out and find another gear within you to trust what was what you were hearing yeah trust your instinct like that was massive and to hold the fucking line because that's (laughs) ultimately what you had to do like I know you were scared shitless. I was there in spirit yeah. and like via iMessage, but like <laughs> you had to really hold the line. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had to trust in what she had told me. I had to trust in that feeling because really that's all it is. It's a feeling, you know, I had to trust in that. And <clears throat> one of the really cool things that, because I was having trouble with that manifestation, I'd be like, I can picture it in my head, but I have a hard time feeling it in my body. Like, how do I do that? And the, and you had introduced that really cool game to us, the remember when game. Oh yeah. 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 That was one of the best ways where, where we would, you know, pretend that we're a year in the future. And then we would talk backwards and be like, remember when you discovered you were pregnant and we would talk through it. Like it was really happening. My husband and I played that game together. Mm-hmm. And that was massive for getting us on the same page and excited and, and just like, bringing that manifestation into our relationship. And the first time we played it was on the Easter weekend. So nearly a year ago. And it's really interesting when I think back, because like that was a big, and I remember we were playing this remember when game and he's like, yeah. And so what are you like five months pregnant now? And I was like, yeah, about that. So now here we're coming up to Easter weekend and I'll be about five months pregnant. Oh, it's giving me goosebumps. I'm like, I know. Ah. I mean, look at how quickly you made that transformation and how quickly, I mean, like, and, and weren't, we get that you're not about speed, you know, with a 15 year journey, like I mean, there, <laughs> nothing about this is like, it's necessarily about speed and, and that's not what we're going for here. But what's interesting to me outside looking in is how quickly you changed Mm -hmm. and how quickly you found that other gear and how quickly Ruby found her way here. Like, I mean, it's just incredible. Like, cause when you think in like, in the, these blocks of time, like a lot happened really quickly. Oh yeah. And that was the missing piece. Like the mental, the mental piece was the missing piece. We had a great formula but there was a huge, a gaping hole in my strategy of my mind that was crap. Right. And so, and then, like you said, though, getting Chris and I on the same page too. And so that was that. Yeah. And so once that work started and we had the tools, things changed really fast, but that's what I needed. I needed that coaching. I needed the formula to be like, these are the things this is how you uncover what's going on inside of you. And, you know, it takes a very strong human being such as yourself to be able to ask for that help because you could have like, I I mean, there's so many excuses that, that we can make to not do what we know to do or to know that we need help, that we can, we can blow shit off. We can, you know, just make a, a, a litany of excuses, but you were so committed to your dream, Robin, that you stop making those excuses. Cause like you didn't make excuses with me. Like, you know, whether it was in the program or when we were coaching privately, like in that block of time, like you weren't an excuse maker. No. And I did the work. Like I was up doing my morning practice every single morning. I never missed a Saturday call in that whole time. Like I was committed to doing that work. First of all, because it worked. And I could feel it working, even though it still took a while before I had the physical pregnancy. I felt it working inside a of me. My, hus- 
Girl, well, that was like <laughs> that was like nine months. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, in nine less months. than a year on a 15 yeah. year journey, you go from like zero to Ruby. Like, I mean, it that's right. <laughs> incredible. I should make that a t-shirt. Zero to yeah. That's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> yeah. You're right. You're right. And I felt I could feel it working. I could feel the change in me. And it just gave me back my joy. It gave me back my vigor. It gave me back that like positivity and that that outlook. It made life so much more fun again. And that rubbed off on my whole family. Wow. Wow. And I and I can tell, and I because Diana was on here, uh gosh, I can't remember her episode was like maybe a month and a half ago. But I mean, it there's something that happens when you bring like-minded women together that are as fiercely committed to their dream as well. Like you guys just the sparks fly. It's like so amazing. And you have to know that your transformation didn't just affect your family. I mean, that's a that's an amazing outgrowth of your own transformation. But who you became impacted all of the women around you. Mm-hmm. And all of the Thank women you. listening to this, like, do you get that? Like, I, I mean, I really want people to take away from this. I mean, there's myriad things are going to take away from this because you've been so kind and generous. But there's another piece that when you have the guts to live your dream, it isn't just for you. It's frankly for everyone else and everyone else's life that you're going to touch. Because sister girl, hearing your voice and and hearing your commitment, there's a woman, I promise you, whose life has changed because you have the guts to hold out for Ruby. Right now, you're changing another woman's life. I know, my God, thank God I'm wearing waterproof (laughs) mascara. Because you were willing to live your dream, you're changing a life right now. Do you get that? I receive it. Oh, man. It is so worth it. It's worth all the heartache and all the work and all the time and all the days. It is just so worth it. Totally. Totally. Amen, sister. Well, thank you so much for sharing your this thank you with us and and sharing your story and and sharing the the joy because I know everyone's gonna be like, go Ruby, go, you know, just <laughs> listening to this and just gonna be looking at their own lives and their own journey in in such a completely different way. So thank you for that, Robin. Thank you, Roseanne. Thank you so much for this important work that you do. It's just such a valuable part of our world. Thank you. Love this episode of the Fearlessly Fertile podcast? Subscribe now and leave an awesome review. Remember, the desire in your heart to be a mom is there because it was meant for you. When it comes to your dreams, keep saying hell yes.